On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with author and well-known atheist John Loftus about his book, The Outsider Test for Fate, How to Know Which Religion is True. When we falsify the idea that you are this biological robot, and we accept that that's absurd, and once we get past the idea that consciousness ends at death, when I cross that chasm and I say, okay, that's the evidence, and I have to deal with it, a lot of things start falling differently in terms of how I orient myself to morals, purpose, meaning in life. You are not a biological robot. Well, you know, you, okay, all right, fine. I mean, I, I disagree, and I've said why, so. Um, of course, you disagree. You stand up and say, I am a biological robot. I am going to stand by that. Well, there's no evidence for invisible beings or entities. Hey, but, but you, as you live your life, you live your life like a biological robot. Everybody does. That's, that's, um, that's all there is. <laughs> okay. I, I don't want to discount your questions. I don't want to. I think that you might be doing a service to atheists. I encourage the exploration of all the ideas. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and this episode of Skeptico is yet another in this series I've been doing on atheism. Now, I do feel a need to tell you a little bit about how I came to do this interview, because as you know, if you've listened, you just heard a similar kind of debate with philosophy professor Dr. Stephen Law. And actually, these two interviews with Dr. Law and John Loftus came about as the result of my interview on episode 217 with Gary Marcus, because Gary Marcus, of course, is this NYU professor of psychology, best-selling author, writes frequently on consciousness issues, yet, if you listen to the interview, stumbled with some basic questions about consciousness, and surprisingly, but I guess not surprisingly for me, because I keep pounding on this drum, is essentially atheistic in his thinking. That is, academia is atheistic. So you go to a guy like Gary Marcus, he's not waving the flag for atheism, but you push through just a little bit and boom, there it is, the same kind of talking points parroted back to you that you hear from atheists. So that led me to saying, you know, I really need to revisit the atheist proposition directly and establish a dialogue with some atheists. So the way that I often do that is I go to Amazon and I look for the best-selling books in the category I'm interested in. In this case, it was atheism. And I came up with Dr. Stephen Law's book, and I also came up with John Loftus's book. So it's kind of a numbers game in inviting guests on. You don't get everyone you ask. So a lot of times I'll go out with a couple of requests and hope to get one. In this case, I got both of them. I got one, and then a week later, John Loftus responded and said, hey, I missed the email, but I'd be happy to do it. So I felt obligated, and I felt like there was enough of a difference between the two that I could pursue both of them, because they really cover two different aspects of the atheism proposition. One is the philosophy of science proposition that you heard from Dr. Stephen Law that I think doesn't hold up very well. And from the discussion we've had, he doesn't really come off as sounding like he has a very strong case, but we'll kind of leave that as it is. And then the second is this religious thrust that you get from John Loftus, whose website is all about debunking Christianity. But as you'll hear in this dialogue, it seems to come up short and actually sound somewhat convoluted once you get past some of these silly, empty tomb Christianity kind of debate. And let me add one more thing that I've said in the past, but I think bears repeating. These kind of interviews are among the most important kind of interviews I can do, that I can bring forward. Because I believe the number one thing that holds people back from making their own personal paradigm shift, beyond the silliness of this, you are a biological robot meme that gets jammed down your throat, the number one barrier is wow, there's so many smart people out there that go along with that idea. How can all these really smart people be wrong? 
So in that sense, I think exposing how an Oxford philosopher and an NYU professor of psychology and a well-known author and blogger who, who really seems to have his stuff together when he debates Christians can stumble so miserably over basic fundamental questions that we address every week on Skeptico. Questions of consciousness, questions of how do we resolve the overwhelming evidence that suggests that consciousness isn't solely a function of the brain. I mean, that data is there, and we talk about that data a lot, but the big gap is, why doesn't that data penetrate? Why doesn't it make a difference? And that really requires studying the people that you would expect to be in a position to know better, who for whatever reason have not allowed that data to penetrate their worldview. Oh, and one more thing to add to this introduction before I let it go out the door. And by the way, there's quite a bit I have to say at the conclusion of this interview, so do stick around for that. But before we get there, one more thing to add, because you've heard this charge so many times, sandbagging, blindsided, all that stuff that these guys say over and over and over again whenever they lose. So I did, I almost forgot to, but I managed to go back and look at the original email that I sent to John Loftus when I invited him on Skeptico. I have to read this for you because here is a guy who's blindsided. Let's see how I invited him on the show. Hi, John. I'd like to know if you'd be available for an interview to discuss your blog and recent book, The Outsider Test for Faith. While I've enjoyed many of your withering attacks on goofy Christian apologetics, I'm always left wondering whether the science of human consciousness has been brought to the table. Do people have genuine spiritual experiences? Question mark. Is our mind purely a function of our brain? Question mark. Are these topics slash questions you've examined, and would you be open to discussing them on Skeptico? Question mark. Followed by my usual boilerplate about Skeptico and some of our previous guests. Blindsided indeed. Okay, thanks for bearing through this long introduction. Here's my dialogue with John Loftus. Today we welcome John W. Loftus to Skeptico. John has an interesting background, having earned advanced degrees in theology and philosophy at Lincoln Seminary and again at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, where he studied under none other than Dr. William Lane Craig. All of that before leaving the Christian Church and becoming a popular atheist author and blogger, John is here to talk about his new book, The Outsider Test for Faith. How to Know Which Religion is True. Quite a provocative title. John, welcome to Skeptico, and thanks for joining me. Well, uh, uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So can you start by telling folks what is the outsider test and how you came up with it? Well, the outsider test for faith is a test to determine uh, you know, which religion is true if, if there is one. And it uh, asks people to uh, test their own faith in the, with the same standards that they use when examining other faiths. It's to test their own faith as if they were non-believers, uh, you know, in their own, because that's how they test the faiths that they reject. And how I came up with it was, uh, you know, online discussions. I run the blog Debunking Christianity, and... You know, I was told by some uh, Christian apologists that, you know, I, I'm ignorant, that I, really, <laughs> that I really don't understand the Christian faith because you can't understand it unless you're an insider to it. And, uh, well, you know, I, I was a former Christian, uh, you, know, a, you know, with three master's degrees, one of them earned under, you know, William Lane Craig. I mean, you know, the, the ignorance charge really doesn't stick with me, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, yet still... They were right in a sense because at that point, having rejected you know my Christian faith, uh, I was at that point an outsider, and 
I realized that there is a different sort of standard when you're an outsider to a faith as, uh, as I was an insider. I, I was um, you know, indoctrinated to believe I didn't know different, and uh, so I accepted it. And when I accepted it, I uh, preferred it to be true, and I argued that it was true from an insider's perspective. And, you know, it just dawned on me that the proper way to evaluate any faith, including one's own, is to do so as a non-believer. That's that's the only appropriate way to do so. And so then, uh, you know, I proposed the outsider test of faith, um, you know, to um, examine your own faith in the, with the same standards that you examine the other religions that you reject. And, you know, I got a, a lot of backlash from it from Christian philosophers. And uh, the, this book is the, the culmination of a lot of thought on on what it entails and and to uh, deal with the objections to it that have ensued since that time. Well, I have to say, I thought it was great. It's one of those books where the title really captures it pretty much. You dig into it and you go, wow, that makes a lot of intuitive sense. And I have to tell you, I have a little experience with the Outsider Test for Faith because I was preparing for this show and I got an email from a listener, and it was one of those emails we like to get. You know, it was a guy, I'll call him Andy, and he was like, hey, man, I like the show. I like how you square off against this scientific materialism. And then he started telling me that I was a little bit off on my kind of anti-Christian rhetoric, and then he laid into me with a lot of scripture. I don't usually read emails that have a lot of scripture. I usually kind of slide past those. But I said, hey, here's an opportunity I told him that I'm going to be interviewing you. I said, here's this guy, Outsider Test for Faith. Andy, why don't you take the Outsider Test through an email exchange? And he did. So let me, let me ask you, since you've been through this over and over and over again, how do you think that went? And then I'll tell you how it went. Well, usually they initially reject it. Usually Christians will hear of it and, and reject it outright as uh, skewed. Uh, because, probably because it's proposed by an atheist, and they figure any any uh, any test for faith that's proposed by an atheist, is, it's got to be skewed, it's got to be wrong. So initially, my guess is he uh, objected to it, and um, you know m- maybe in the process of discussing that with him, he may have come to realize, well, you know, it's it's not so bad after all, and then. You know, he probably he might claim, well, my my faith passes the test after all. Um, am, am I wrong? Well, the, the last part is definitely where we wound up. I'll, I'll give you a quick recap. The first round was more scripture. And I said, hey, Andy, we can't really play that game. I mean, you can't use scripture to validate scripture. I mean, you kind of get in this circular thing. But he rallied. He, he came around to that. And in the second round, he came along with, I think, the uh, apologist line of defense, which I see, which is, it's not as bad as it seems. <laughs> you know, Okay, maybe we have some problems. Maybe we're not perfect, but it's not as bad as it seems. You know, here's some rebuttals to Bart Ehrman and the rest. To which I said, yeah, but that's not really the outsider test. The outsider test would be, why not Mormonism? Why not Joseph Smith? Which... He got in the spirit of it, but it kind of came back to, yeah, well, if I really do it, then my religion really is best. Let me show you why Jesus is better than everybody else kind of thing. So I don't know. What's, what's, how do you get through with the outsider test for faith? Well, you know, it's difficult with a, the mind of a believer because most of them were never argued into their faith in the first place. So it's unlikely we can argue them out of it. You know, that's, I have to say, that's one point that Andy made that I do give him credit for at the end. And I, and I appreciate, you know, it, straight up guy, he really got into it and exchanged this with me, and I appreciate that. But his point at the end, he said, you know, one point I'd like to ask, ask Loftus is, you know, what's an outsider? None of us are outsiders. We all come to the game with some baggage. And what would be your response to that? Uh, well, we know what it's like to be an outsider of other religious faiths, and uh, so um, I don't see a problem with uh, you know singling out a religious faith uh, from the other cultural you know beliefs that we might have, and examining that you know one piece of our worldview at a time. I think that Christians 
misunderstand the difference between you know a religion and a worldview. What they think is the case is is that what they believe is part of their total worldview, such that you, we can't extricate one's religious faith from that worldview without subjecting our whole worldview, you know, to the test. And you know, quite frankly, we can't really do that. I mean, we <clears throat> we can't <clears throat> question everything that we believe at the same time. We do have uh, a multifaceted number of of beliefs and conclusions that we've arrived at that, you know, it's just impossible, psychologically speaking, to question them all at the same time. Uh, but we know what it's like to question our political beliefs. We know what it's like to, you know, question our ethical beliefs. We know what it's like to, you know, question anything. You know, um, someone says that they levitated and we know how to single that, you know, out for Scrutiny. So um, they misunderstand that the you know one's religious belief is not equivalent <clears throat> to one's whole worldview. And to get that point across, uh, what we do is we just simply uh, you know talk about the the kinds of of things that we maintain even though we reject our faith. Now we can ask ex believers that question, and uh, you know I mean for instance <clears throat> I didn't reject my language. I still speak you know English. Um, I didn't uh, reject, uh, you know, love. I didn't reject, you know, uh, how I negotiate the, the, the price of a car. Um, I, I didn't uh, reject um, the loving of my family. I, I, you know, there's a host of uh, things that I have maintained throughout my, um, you know, my skeptical quest because, um, you know, I'm, I'm a living testament that you can subject your religious faith to a separate inquiry. Um, and still maintain everything else that you believe. Um, now, now, a lot of things have uh, fallen by the wayside, but there's a lot of things that um, you know I still have uh, maintained throughout you know that uh, that quest. So, uh, it, it's like a, a boat analogy, and I write about this in in my book. Um, you know, we can uh, we can sub we can replace one plank in our boat at a time. Now, the, our one's religious faith is definitely a big plank. But, um, you know, when we're at sea, if uh, <clears throat> one plank of our boat is leaky, and we can replace it and, uh, without, um, you know, uh, replacing the whole boat. Hey, I, I love that analogy. I, I just wonder how that really holds up in this kind of culture war battle that we're in. You know, I love the approach that you take in terms of separating those worldviews from your religious views. But I wonder if that's how the game is really played. It's like when I hear some of these debates between atheists and Christians, I'm like, wow, that's really kind of missing the point because most Christians are not all that Christian and most atheists are not all that atheist, atheistic in the way that you're saying. But on the other hand, when I read your site, Debunking Christianity, and you chronicle and document how deeply woven some of these religious beliefs are into our culture, into our society. I go, you know, maybe we have to replace it more than one plank at a time. And I wonder if that's where you're going. Can we really say philosophically, like you're saying, well, I'm just going to kind of carve this religious piece out, but I'm going to go forward with the other claims that Christians make about the worldview. Don't we have to step back and say, well, what about the atheist claims for my worldview? Let me ask you, do you believe that modern atheism makes any claims about worldview kind of issues? Because I think they do. Um, you know, I, I think that um, the best answer is no. Um, the, the best answer is that atheism is non-belief. I mean, the, the word atheism means a theism, that is, non-theism, and by extension, non-believer. We don't believe, just like we don't believe that, um, you know, some guy levitated, you know, who claims that he did, we basically say, um, you know, show me the evidence. But basically, an atheist is someone who says, you know, I don't think there is enough evidence to believe this. Now, what is the this? Well, it's uh, virgin births, it's resurrections from the dead, it's asses that talk, it's donkeys that, uh, you know, talk, snakes that, that uh, walk. walk. Uh, we, we don't believe 
that. Um, now, uh, it's it, it, those kind of things, levitating Buddhists, etc. Um, and so, um, you know, that doesn't mean that we aren't um, uh, indoctrinated within our own culture to, to believe a, a host of things as well. It's just that those are the kinds of things that uh, we don't believe. Now, I, I do think that once uh, one becomes an atheist, then they do see the world a bit differently. So, you know, that, that's true as well. Um, but it, that's a gradual process. I mean, I, <clears throat> I mean, I have to face the fact that this is the only life I will ever live. Uh, that's a, that's a, you know, that can be a life-changing thing. Uh, for me, and that I will never see my my dad, who died in '88 again, uh, those kind of things, and that I have to decide on my own how to live my life, you know, apart from a you know divine authority. Th there are a lot of things that go go with that. You know, I, I no longer have the answers, you know, to questions from divine authority. Uh, you know, so there's a lot that goes with the rejection of one's religion. Okay, I'll grant I'll grant you that, and there's a lot that um, an atheist will. You know, usually conclude, you know, you know, as an atheist, uh, I'll, I'll grant that too. Like you said, I'll grant that. Um, but I, I just think I, I see no reason to suppose that we can't uh, subject, you know, one of our one of our culturally uh, indoctrinated beliefs to to a test. Now, I would have to guess that the religious belief that one has is probably you know the biggest plank in the boat. You know, I mean, I, I'll have to grant that. Um, and I also have to grant that once one becomes an atheist, then then he or she will reject the the uh, the morality that they think is found in the Bible, you know, or whatever that is. Um, but they can decide to love on their own. You know, they can decide to care for people on their own. That's the problem, I guess. And I, I didn't know you were going to go quite that far with what your beliefs are, because I think some of those beliefs are tricky. I mean, they would have to be subjected to the same kind of scientific criteria that we would subject anything to. That's maybe another discussion. But I will, when you, when you say uh, I'm, you're still open to love, you're still open to some kind of morals, but they're morals of choice. I mean, people who listen to this show might get tired of this because we just hash this out at length on the forum. But I'd suggest to you, you're a philosopher, that that's logically inconsistent. I mean, if life has no meaning, there is no good and bad, then if consciousness, as uh, Daniel Dennett says, is an illusion, then it's all an illusion, right? The love is an illusion, everything is an illusion, good or bad is an illusion. I don't know how we can really pick and choose those planks the way that you're, you're kind of talking about. Isn't it kind of an all or nothing proposition? Well, you know, I, no, it's, it's, it's not. Um... I'm not exactly aware of your previous, you know, podcasts to know, you know, where you uh, land on these uh, sorts of issues. Uh, it is tricky. I mean, it is tricky. I, I don't, for instance, think that um, that we can come to our conclusions uh, very easily, very readily. Uh, maybe we don't have free will, uh, like Daniel Dennett uh, says. Uh, maybe consciousness is an illusion. Uh, you know, maybe we live in a, in a matrix too. You know, maybe there isn't a material world. Uh, these are the kinds of questions that philosophers ask. But you know, even if we were to live in an illusion, uh, let's say the matrix, if I may, that doesn't make any difference uh, because you know we still have to live in the illusion. I mean, we still have to make choices in the illusion. Why? Why? Why would? Why would we perpetuate that at all? I mean. It gets to the really deep philosophical question of why choose life at all. I mean, it's all it's all an illusion. There's nothing. There, you're not doing anything. Nothing is happening. You're not moving towards anything. Your parents don't matter. Your children don't matter. Nothing matters. I mean, that is. Oh logic. come on! Are, are you playing the devil's advocate with me? Because um, I find that ludicrous. Uh, you know, I find it ludicrous to say that nothing matters. I mean, really. I do it, too, but that's at the that's at the core of this. This how, how well, then where do, what matters then? How do we decide what matters? Uh, um, it doesn't matter now, in uh, in August of two thousand and thirteen, what I do in life, a million years from now. I mean, it, a million years from now. Nothing I have ever done matters. It doesn't matter. So ultimately, 
nothing matters. But it does matter to the people I love and the people who love me, my friends. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's um, so I find that ludicrous to say nothing well, John, matters. There's no such thing as lo- there's no such thing as love. Love is an illusion. Love is an illusion. There's a, it's this chemical reaction you have in your brain that you're programmed to do. I, I mean, it's uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, you're you're scoffing, but I scoff too. I think the whole idea that we don't have free will is is ludicrous. I think the idea that love isn't real is ludicrous. But I, I think in that same way, I think we never examine fully those claims that are being made by atheists. We wind up talking about codices and empty tombs and other crazy stuff, but we never talk about what's at the core of this idea that you are as Dawkins, Richard Dawkins says, a biological robot. And I think that is at the core of this debate because Christians aren't all that Christian and atheists aren't all that atheistic. What people say is, you guys say nothing and I say something. You guys say biological robot and I say, I ain't no biological robot and you want to talk about free will? Hell yes, I have free will. Of course I have free will. It's obvious I have free will. From your philosophical background, isn't there a philosophical gap there? Aren't you kind of trying to play some middle ground there that doesn't really exist when you want to say, I'm still about love, I'm still about caring for the people I care about? How is that really consistent with this biological robot meme that Richard Dawkins gives us? Well, let's put it to you this way. Let's um, a, a grant with uh, many uh, philosophers, uh, materialists, that we don't have free will. Just, just grant it for a minute. I know that you find that ludicrous, but let's, uh, let's, let's just grant we don't have free will. Well, I it think you change. find it ludicrous too, by the way, but go ahead. I, I'm sorry? I, I mean, I, I suspect that you find it ludicrous. You don't live your life like you don't have free will. Of course, you live your life every day, but go ahead. Well, yeah, right, right. And so, uh, so, I, so I make choices, and uh, these choices affect people and the people that um, matter to me. And so uh, I can't do any other. And uh, I, I, I do make choices. And, you know, that's, that's all there is to it. I, um, I don't find that, um, you know, the idea that, I mean, I, I, I'm, I, let me just say it this way. My specialty isn't in um, discussions about free will. I mean, I, I have to stick to things that, you know, I have a specialty in. But um, there are some brighter minds than I who have looked at the issue, you know, naturalists, you know, atheists, materialists, and they've concluded we don't have free will. I find their arguments um, pretty persuasive, actually. But um, uh, but that doesn't change a thing. It's like, it's like uh, living in a matrix. Uh, it doesn't change a thing. Let's say we are. Let's say everything's an illusion. Let's say we have no free will. It doesn't change a thing. We still have to act and we still have to make choices and we still have to decide based on the evidence, uh, you know, what we will believe. Now you say, well, all that is, you know, not, not free inside you. Let's, let's grant that. Um, what that does is it destroys Christianity as well. And that's, that's my point. If we have no free will, it destroys Christianity as well. Because, uh, you know, the, the, the free will uh, unto salvation, you know, choice to believe in Jesus is gone. There, there's no, there's no hell. Um, there's no, there's no rational basis to believe in uh, in God uh, either. So, but they still have to make the choices they do based on the evidence that they they, they think is the case. And I'm even though we're, even though we're both potentially in the matrix, even though we're we're both uh, without free will, we still have these arguments, and they still change minds. Uh, and um, there and are I think, no minds. There are no minds. We are right, biological brains. robots. I mean, brains. look. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Brains. Well, brains. we can't we can't change brains. They're, again, they're robotic. They just act according to their preconceived. This is ludicrous. Like, like, look, I understand where you're coming from. You're focusing on Christianity and debunking right. Christianity, and there's a lot to be done there. But I think you've kind of made my case to a certain extent. This okay. logically, it logically <laughs> falls apart. And moreover, like I always tell people is, you know, 
your philosophy isn't as complicated as it seems. It's how you live your life, you know? And uh, point to me the person who lives their life like love isn't real, like connection with people isn't real. Sure. It's just, it, it's silliness, it's absurdity in the same way that, that some of this other stuff in terms of biblical inerrancy gets into the absurd really quickly when you follow it. But I do think where that leads us then is to maybe re-examine some of those assumptions that are underlying atheism, underlying this idea that, you know, we are these biological robots. But maybe that isn't something you've really gone into very far. Well, um, I, I make, I'll make an argument that if that's the case, you know, if, if that's the case, uh, then, uh, we, you know, there's simply there's no other uh, way around uh, living our lives like we do and making the arguments that we do. Well, but hold on. You can cut that short and just say there's no reason to really live your life. Your life is an absurdity. It, it, it makes no sense. To, when you get to the point of realizing that this is true to that extent, there's really no, the famous philosopher Albert Camus said this, you know, there's only one philosophical question, suicide. If you really believe that life is that meaningless. There's no need to continue the meaninglessness. There's no need for future generations or past generations or evolution. It's all meaningless. There's no reason to go on. That's the logical extension here. And of course, it's absurd, but it's the absurdity of the atheist position, I should say. Yeah. Well, I think it's absurd to end your life. I think we have the will to survive, and um, you know that's that's all there is to it. And uh, you know to live one's life uh, based on a delusion that uh, there's a God who's going to reward you into in, into heaven. <clears throat> I think that's uh, you know that's a, even more absurd. I think that we can do more. We can do better. Uh, we, we, this is the only life we've been given. I think that this universe is uh, you know quite uh, remarkable. For life, and uh, you know, let's let's extend it uh, as long as we can. Let's let's not have that uh, nuclear warfare that uh, might ensue if believers get their hands on the trigger. And you know, I, I do that for my posterity. I do that for my kids. I do that for future generations. Let's let's extend this. Let's see <clears throat> let's see how long we can live on Earth. Let's see what we can accomplish. Now, I'll never see it, uh, but uh, <clears throat> you know, that's uh, that's not absurd to uh, to want that. Uh, given the fact that this is a, a, quite a remarkable experiment, I, you know, you you might think that <clears throat> that, that that's uh, absurd, but like I said, it's more absurd. I mean, it's, it's absurd to the core to live one one's life on a delusion. I mean, accept the fact, whatever the facts are. There's no reason why anyone should ex should reject a conclusion be if the evidence points to that conclusion just because they don't like the conclusion. And I find a lot of Christians do that. They, they simply, well, we reject, uh, we reject the outsider test for faith or we reject um, you know, atheism's conclusion that all we are, are is, is biology in motion. They reject that because they don't like the conclusion. And the conclusion is, you know, well, maybe we don't have free will and maybe our life isn't uh, going to be meaningful for, you know, uh, you know in a million years. Uh, you know, that, well, that's that's rejecting the evidence for a conclusion based on the conclusion. Bite the bullet. If the evidence is there, bite the bullet. You know, that I'm sorry. <laughs> you have to live life. We are thrust into this life, Camus also said, and um, or was it Sartre? We're, we're, we're thrust into this life. We didn't ask to be here. And so make the best of it. And uh, that's what we're doing. Okay, let's get off the philosophy because I think it's, we've maybe ridden that horse as far as we can. <laughs> and I appreciate you, you going in and digging into these things. I, I understand that the main thrust of your work is this idea of debunking Christianity. You do right. a nice job on your blog of really, as I mentioned earlier, bringing up all the cultural issues that surround Christianity and Christianity's movement forward. You know, I mean, I think there's a lot of sense uh, among intellectual people and academic people that, hey, you know, that's really not so much of an issue in our society anymore, and there's this waning of Christianity. But I think what you do on your website is point out that that's not really always the case, and there is still this strong cultural movement towards this very bracketed kind of view of, uh, of the world that comes from Christian dogma. That's my focus. Yeah, that's my focus. It's my niche. It's uh, <clears throat> basically a, a destructive kind of a 
game. Uh, I don't want to use the word game so much as uh, strategy. Strategy would work. It, uh, my focus is on destroying, uh, destroying ideas. It's uh, debunking. It's saying this is wrong, and I doubt it, and there's no evidence for it. Um, I, I don't necessarily focus on constructing a metaphysical um, uh, a naturalist worldview. Others do that much better than I do. And I learn from them. Uh, but I, I have a single-minded purpose to debunk the influence of Christianity in the society and in the world. Uh, and there are many reasons for it. And that's because I think faith ultimately causes harm to the people of faith and others as they are involved in society. And so uh, if I can get rid of that influence or if I can minimize it in even a small way, for future generations, I think that uh, that's a good thing. I think that people need to think for themselves rather than mindlessly quote from the Bible or the theology based on it. Uh, I've seen too much in my life that um, leads me to think people would be better off without it. Well, I, I think we're probably in sync there. I think I'm kind of an iconoclast and a destroyer as well, but I guess I've set my sights a little bit differently because the last topic I guess I'd bring up, you talked about a lot of evidence there and, and that you are evidence-based. What I've really focused on is, one, falsifying this this biological robot, this mind equals brain idea. It's falsified all over the place. I mean, I got dozens of very well-qualified, highly respected researchers who suggest that that's not the case. One of the main topics we talk about in the show a lot is near-death experience research, science, published papers. A lot of people don't know that there's over a hundred peer-reviewed scientific papers on near-death experience. I'm wondering, have you looked at near-death experience science at all? Have you dealt with it either on your blog? I know it's not in your book because I, I look there. Any thoughts on that? Well, uh, Victor uh, Stenger wrote a chapter where in the, my anthology, The End of Christianity, <clears throat> where he looked at uh, Dinesh D'Souza's claims uh, of those sorts of things. Hold on. One, Victor Stanger's been on the show. I don't think he fared very well. I don't think his chapter on near-death experience holds up. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But Dinesh D'Souza is not a near-death experience researcher. He's a Christian apologist. So one of the things I think a lot of atheist folks don't understand is I'm not talking about people that have an axe to grind. I'm talking about people at university who are publishing in peer-reviewed journals. These are not people who have a preconceived uh, idea or, or a, a, a thing that they're driving for. They're saying, this is a medical mystery. The doctor says, hey, this guy got up off the table after being resuscitated and said, this is what I saw. That's a medical mystery I need to investigate. Anyone would be curious about investigating it. So they have, and this is what they found out. That's evidence I think we have to just confront and deal with one way or another. Oh, I agree. I agree. Um, you know, all, all I can do is <clears throat> point you to the experts. Uh, again, that's not my focus. Uh, you know, uh, Keith Augustine and Michael Martin, uh, the, the atheist philosopher, and Keith Ar Augustine is, um, I think, the executive director of Secular, uh, let's see, infidels.com, what have you. Uh, they've done a lot of uh, research on, on those sorts of things, and I no, think you they can have them. But that's okay. That's okay. No, it's not. It's not your your thing. I get it. I mean, but those people haven't done anything. Well, you know what? You know what? I'm going to just tell you. I mean, I, I have a predisposition against those sorts of things because I have no clue what the difference is between a mind and a brain is. I don't know where the mind is located. I don't know how the mind works. Uh, you know, I know you can have brain damage, and all of a sudden it affects the mind. Now, to explain that, I, I know. I know there's a lot of things, uh, you know, that can happen, a stroke, a seizure, Alzheimer's. You know, why is, the, why is the mind affected by those things? It seems like if you just started whittling away with the brain, you'd have no mind left. Um, now, that seems to be a, a supervening type of evidence over to these uh, experiential claims. And, uh, I would, you know, I, I don't know. I haven't done those sorts of researches. But I know that there's a, a lot of things that neuro neurology is now discovering about the brain that explains any phenomena that we might want to explain. Now, I, I, uh, I just find that sort of argument, philosophical, evidential as it is, to, uh, to be supervening until I can see some uh, clear evidence that, you know, ghosts exist. And I don't even understand how ghosts can walk through walls. You know, these movies... Uh, 
these movies that depict ghosts, why are they standing on the ground? You know, why don't they just fall into the middle of the earth? I mean, why aren't they just floating in the air? I mean, uh, these sorts of things, uh, you know, they, they're just, uh, uh, I have a predisposition to call them all loony, you know, before looking at them. Now, I know you disagree. That's fine. Disagree. But uh, until you can explain why neurology is explaining more and more about why we think and wh- I mean, how we learn to think and what regions of the brain we, we think with and how to, you know, you know, do brain surgery and, and use drugs to cure the mind, then, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't assent to the proposition that there's a mind in the first place. I don't know, I don't know any invisible entity that can exist outside of a physical body in the, in the first place. So where's it, where's it exist? Is this my toes? Is this my knee? You know, um, why is it located up here? Why do you think the mind is here, not in my nose? Or why is it not my whole body? And if it's my whole body, well, then why not identify it with my body? I find it interesting you wanted to interview me on the outsider test for faith and you have a pet peeve. And, you know, free will. I mean, if you, wanted to, if you wanted to interview someone about free will, if you wanted to interview someone about near-death experiences, well, then why don't, why don't you contact someone who wants to, you know, talk about that, who's done some research on it? I, I have. I have. I got 200 shows. You got to, I mean... You know, I mean, like, you, you, want, to, you want to try to blindside me with, with a false pretense of uh, talking about something I know about, and uh, you want to talk about things that, you know, um, I haven't commented on yet. Watch out, I can <laughs> I, I don't get that. You know, I, I hear that sometimes. John, you, you can ask me, you can ask me anything in this field. You can ask me about Christianity. You can ask me about, uh, you can ask me about anything. Your, your, views, your views intrigue me, I, I have to say. Well, it, uh, okay. And, but I, I don't understand why. I, I told you how I came at this, right? And uh, I, I, I did the outsider test for faith. My point is really that this discussion is stuck in stupid. The atheist versus Christian debate is stuck on stupid, and I'm tired of it. I'm tired of empty tombs and codices and all this nonsense that doesn't get us to the real issue that we talked about of what are the claims of atheism. If they stand up, if they're the right claims, then I'm on board. I want to know what the truth is. So if you can... If you can defend those claims, then go ahead and do it. But I'm past, I'm with you. Let me just say, I'm with you. I'm with you on the outsider test of faith. I'm with you on debunking Christianity. I'm saying, dude, turn the page and let's get on to the real discussion. I don't know why you'd find that so offensive. Oh, I know. I, I, I didn't say I was offended. I just said that, uh, you know, you, you want to talk about you know other things and and that's okay i mean uh, let's let's go with it i mean i i think that uh you know you you think uh, you you basically you're telling me okay now move on uh, christianity has been debunked now let's move on kind of kind of yeah i am saying that that's fine that's fine i mean i, I understand the criticism uh, i'm not moving on though and the reason why is because there are still uh, a majority of people out in out there who are who are Christians? I I just went to the Creation Museum in, in Kentucky uh, a couple of days ago. I wrote about it on my blog. Uh, it would be August. Um, it would be August eighth, you know, on my blog. And, I saw it there. Uh, okay, and um, you know, I mean, it's just ludicrous. I mean, you should see the number of people lined up for that, and and, and the money that it takes to 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 build that, and they're building a, a second part to it where they're going to have a life size Noah's Ark, and there are people paying twenty nine dollars, you know, a hit to go through that. Um, and they, these people go, you know, these people, these people write letters to their senators, uh, and they're a danger to society. I mean, and all I can do is argue them out of it. And I'm going to continue doing that because that's my expertise. Now, you know, uh, others, uh, you know, I can't know everything. I mean, you, you got to admit that. I mean, with yourself, we, we, no one can know everything. So I'm going to focus because I think that's where my particular expertise is and I'm going to continue doing so. I think that's good. As I mentioned before, I think there's a lot of work to still be done there. And I think when we move past that and say, oh, wow, that's, that's you know, handled, we're, we're way past that, it's, it's not true. And I think you point that out. But I do think as you were scrambling around there trying to do your mind equals brain thing, I, I, you know, I understand the scramble. That's, that's fair. But it, it, it doesn't hold up, okay? Mind equals brain doesn't hold up. The near-death experience science is solid. Vic Stenger, go listen to the interview. He, he, he's quoting the wrong people just like just like you are. These are not people who've published in peer-reviewed so, journals. So, uh, 
Just for your listeners, I mean, your, your listeners would know um, your views more than my listeners would know your views. You you don't accept Christianity. Uh, what do you accept? Just just state briefly for my uh, listeners, uh, you know, own own understanding. Well, I, I always think that's that's a funny question because it kind of gets to the problem. It's like, okay, if you're not Christian, what are you? In terms, I'm of just asking. Like, no, no, no. Fact, I'm, I'm. That's a that's question. funny. No, that that's that's fine. But I think it's part of the problem. It's like it's the problem really that you deal with is that that's how we think of things. We think of things in in, re, in such a religious framework that if someone doesn't immediately sign up with one or the other, we don't know quite how to peg him. All I can say is that when we falsify the idea that you are this biological robot. And we accept that that's absurd. Of course I have free will. I do what I, I, I can. Uh, want me to raise my hand? I raise my hand. Free will. I did it. There, I just proved the test. Once we get past that, and once we get past the idea that consciousness ends at death, which is, again, like you said before, only I don't think you want to accept it, but that's where the evidence points. It just points that way. I don't know what that means, John, but as you said with the Planck's thing, the planks in the boat. When I cross that chasm and I say, okay, that's the evidence and I have to deal with it, a lot of things start falling differently in terms of how I orient myself to the world, how I orient myself to other people, um, how I orient myself to morals, purpose, meaning in life. So that is what I'm exploring but I'm exploring it from the okay, other side of the chasm, if you will. Other side of the chasm. Being consciousness survives death. Let's let's put that as the you know you are not you are not a biological robot. Well, you, you know you. Okay, all right, fine. I mean, I, I disagree, and I've said why. So. Um, that's all I said. Of course, you disagree. You stand up and say, "I am a biological robot. I am gonna stand by that." Well, there's no evidence for invisible beings or entities. Hey, but but you, as you live your life, you live your life like a biological robot. Everybody does. That's, that's, um, that's all there okay. is. Okay. Well, um, you know, all, all, you know, you, you have to look into the, uh, the philosophical quandaries with, uh, the, you know, trying to distinguish between mind and body. I mean, I mean, I, I taught the introduction to philosophy classes that you would probably be interested in in looking at, uh, you know, how, how they how they have tried to uh, relate the mind and the body, and you know, they just really can't do it. I mean, it's really ludicrous to to, to see how they do that, and and um, you know, you need to look at um, the mind body problem. I mean, look at it reasonably philosophically. I know that you say, well, we have evidence for life after death, but there's there's contrary studies. I mentioned a couple of, you know, Michael Martin's doing and Keith Augustine, and you don't like Victor Stenger's uh, views. Uh, okay, fine, but but there are certainly contrary, um, uh, you know, evidence and no, arguments. No, no, that's cool. Hey, I just talked to Stephen Law. I just talked to Stephen Law a couple weeks ago, atheist philosopher at uh, University of London, PhD in philosophy from... Uh, Oxford or Cambridge, I'm sorry, which one I got wrong. But, you know. And you probably blind, you probably blindsided him, too. I, dude, I get this all the time, blindsided. How, how are you blindsided? How are you blindsided? Why can't you talk about this? Why can't you? Why wouldn't you be equipped to talk about this? I'll tell you what, what it, it is. The fact that you feel blindsided says you haven't looked into this enough because these are core questions. Core questions. So you're going around like a gadfly, like Socrates, and trying to ask people about questions that they haven't studied up on uh, too, too uh, well yet. All right, then fine. I mean, do that. Um, you know, you're trying to get atheists to, to look at the evidence that you consider to be there, even though you reject Christianity. And, you know, that's fine. Uh, but I'm not, uh, I'm not the one to ask on those things. I mean, I said what my focus is, and, you know, I think that the conclusions that uh, that, that there is a mind, uh, you know, just don't hold up. I mean, not at all. And uh, from what I've studied, now you say, well, why have you studied this? Well, I don't write a lot about politics either. I mean, uh, you know, have you have you? What if you blindsided me by by asking me about gun control in America? I mean, well. I, I have some ideas on it, and I can point you to some some writings about it. What, what if you ask me uh, about um, you know uh, immigration reform? What if you ask me about uh, Obamacare? I mean, uh, you could do that if you want, but you're asking the, the wrong person. I would have to say, well, you know, you got to talk to this expert. You got to talk to that expert. I mean, we can't know everything, I mean, it's, and it's ludicrous for you to think that I'm supposed to know everything. John, what do you feel most blindsided by in this interview? 
Well, uh, I, I believe you uh, you had asked me to talk about the outsider test for faith, and we're not. Well, well, but what in particular did we talk about that you felt most blindsided? Well, I, I, tell, you, I tell you what, Alex, if you, have, if you don't have anything else more to say than what you've said, then let's call us a day. Now, don't, don't conclude by that that I'm giving up. Don't conclude by that that, I, that, oh, Loftus couldn't answer my questions. You know, that'd be ludicrous as well. I'm just saying, oh, you want to talk about the, uh, the topic or not? I mean, and I, I gather you don't, and that's okay. Let's just call it a day. I've got other things to do. I, I hear you, and I appreciate the hour, and I appreciate your work and the, the book. Thank you so much. I wish, I, I wish you would just tackle that, that last question. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. But what did you feel you were most blindsided by? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll, tell you what, I'll let the listeners uh, decide for themselves uh, on this. But I, I don't want to discount your questions. I don't want to. Um, I think that you might be doing a service to atheists by uh, raising these questions. Uh, I, you know, and so continue that. I, I, I encourage the exploration of all the ideas. Let's say that the, you know, we do have free will. Let's say that there is an afterlife. Let's say that sounds sort of like a deist uh, position to me. Now, a deist, I mean, you, I'm not trying to put a label on you. Not necessarily, but go ahead. Keep going. Okay. All right, fine. Uh, and the deist position is, uh, uh, I think, the only other reasonable uh, position to take. I mean, I think that it is within the realm of, of reason. In fact, uh, deism started a, as a, a movement in England, I think in the 1600s or uh, 1700s, where they wanted to evaluate everything based on reason, you know, reason and evidence. And, uh, you know, deism uh, quickly degenerated into atheism, but there are still uh, deists, you know, around. And, you know, Dawkins, I think Christopher Hitchens said that the only kind of God or religion they might accept would be deism as a mere possibility. So um, that, that's fine. That's fine. And pursue your, if that's what you are, pursue those kinds of questions. And, um, uh, so, but support me. In, in my work, and I think you do, support me in my work as I uh, attack these uh, the, the fundamentalist Christians because you and I are in agreement on this. You're not my enemy. Uh, you are my friend as you, as you tackle those issues as well. Okay. Thanks again. The book is The Outsider Test for Faith. Which we didn't talk about much. You know what? If For the folks who are going to tune out after the first 10 minutes, they, they, I think they heard a lot about it. And you can find out a lot about the Outsider Test. There's a lot of good material out there. There's uh, on, on John's blog, debunkingchristianity.blogspot.com. He talks about it, and there's many reviews on there. There's tons of reviews on Amazon. It's a very popular book, well-received. The Outsider Test for Faith, How to Know Which Religion is True. John W. Loftus, thanks for joining me on a very, this is one of the toughest Skeptico interviews I've ever had, man. I, I, I hope the rest of your day goes better than this hour. <laughs> I, I'm doing fine. Thank you. All right, bye. Thanks again to John for joining me today on Skeptico. As is becoming more and more my custom here on Skeptico, I did have quite an interesting follow-up email exchange with John, and I really can't resist sharing it with you. Here goes. Here's my email to John a day or two after the podcast. Hi, John. Was thinking about our interview yesterday and how you felt blindsided. Now, I'm not sure how a guy with a master's degree in philosophy who's written three books on atheism could be blindsided by basic questions about the philosophy of atheism, but if that's how you felt, then maybe we can fix it. Why don't you come back on Skeptico for a redo? You'll have the advantage of knowing everything I'm going to ask, and you'll have plenty of time to prepare your counter-arguments. John, I know these kind of dialogues can be a bit uncomfortable, but like you say in your book, we have to be willing to look at our beliefs as an outsider if we're ever going to nudge closer to the truth. Alex, John's response, and in order to kind of shorten up this podcast here, I'm going to thread in his response with my response back to him, which is the last we hear from him. We never hear from him after this, even though I ask for him to respond, and, and you'll hear what I ask for him to do, but there's no response from John after this. So here's John's email to me with my response. John writes, Your God 
can safely be ignored as irrelevant and unnecessary, a hypothesis we don't have any need for, even if he or she exists. I mean, why bother with the passion you seem to have for the deist God or the God of the philosophers? Why would anyone care as much as you do about such a God that is a mere curiosity? I reply, where are you getting this from? I didn't even mention God in our interview. John continues, you know nothing about him or her, God that is. You believe she exists in an afterlife. Big deal. You should adopt a protest theology like others have done and protest her existence even if she exists. She clearly has left nebulous evidence that she exists. Why does she need you to make her case for? What difference does it make to it that it exists? I reply, again, I think you've kind of missed the thrust of our discussion. So let me recap the three main points. Number one, atheists. Even popular, media-savvy ones like you who write books and give public presentations often make claims. Example, we are biological robots. Life is meaningless. Consciousness is an illusion. Without realizing the implications. You demonstrated this in our interview when you seemed genuinely confused when I pointed out that your love for family can be nothing more than a meaningless illusion, according to your belief system. Number two, most atheists live their lives in a way that is inconsistent with their stated beliefs. I think you do care about your family. I think you do act as if your choices matter. I think you do think you are doing good in the world by countering the negative impact of fundamentalist religions. But during our interview, you seem to be unable to resolve the absurdity of your bite the bullet, we're all just biological robots with the life you live. Number three, new atheists are in a stuck on stupid debate with fundamentalist Christians when the real action is whether or not consciousness is an illusion. If consciousness is more than an epiphenomena of the brain, as the data suggests, and if consciousness survives bodily death, as the data suggests, then we have to take seriously questions about the order and meaning of consciousness. You don't have to be an expert in consciousness science to see that this leaves little room for your new brand of atheism. Now back to John's email. If we survive death, then we do. It changes nothing. I reply, you're kind of making my points for me. If we survive death, then we are not an illusion. We are not biological robots. This changes everything for the new atheist crowd, as well as for the materialistic science crowd in general. Back to John's email. We should still be good to people. We should still investigate the world through science. Let science do its work. My reply why? I'm surprised you keep stumbling over this. This is atheism 101. First off, how are you defining good in your meaningless world slash universe? And second, why should we should anything? John, no, I must devote my time to more important things. I cannot accept anything based on faith, and that is all you have, despite any protestations from you. Solve the brain-mind problem first. Look into neurology. There is your answer. Then simply bite the bullet. Since evolution is the case, then humans go where all animals go when we die. We all rot in the ground. Period. If instead all animals live forever, then it wouldn't be anything special for all of us to go there. <laughs> That existence would be just another world like ours. Who cares if you're correct, except as a mere curiosity? I'm all for being curious. We need to be curious. But I intend to change the religious landscape. That's my focus. My response. Wow, I'm really having a hard time following your logic. When you say solve the brain-mind problem, it makes me think that you understand that consciousness is the fundamental question to all this. But then you slip into this bite the bullet, we're all just biological robot stuff. 
I agree. Let's not base our beliefs on faith. Let's examine the data. Shall we start with the near-death experience science? And I provided him two links, one to my interview with Jeff Long, and then one to my follow-up interview with Jeff Long, takes on the critics of the afterlife. Back to John's email. If you would like to interview someone on the issue of free will, I highly recommend Jonathan Pierce, author of the book, Free Will? An Investigation into Whether We Have Free Will or Whether I Was Always Going to Write This Book. My response? Sure, happy to. Please pass along my invitation and I'll wait for him to contact me. In order to avoid blindsiding, you may want to suggest the following to Jonathan. And I provided two links. Episode 184, Rupert Sheldrick Sets Science Free from Dogma, and the other from my interview with Dr. Mario Beauregard. By the way, of course, I have yet to hear from Jonathan Pierce, and I doubt I ever will, but the invitation's there. Love to have him on. Back to John's email. If you want to interview someone about life after death, then find Keith Augustine at Internet Infidels. My response Again, I'd be happy to. I've invited him three times, but he never seems to have the time. Please pass along my invitation and I'll await his reply. I then mention that I have interviewed many prominent NDE skeptics, including the link, including Dr. Victor Stenger and Dr. Susan Blackmore. Again, I have yet to hear from Keith Augustine, but Keith, if you're out there, Love to have you on Skeptico to talk about near-death experience science. Finally, wrapping up John's email, he writes, If you want to interview someone about brain-mind problem, then contact either Paul or Patricia Churchland. I've tried. If you want to interview a neuroscientist on the same issue, then contact David Eagleman. Already did. Send him the link. Then, as his final word on whether or not he'd like to come on for a redo, I thought a very fair, generous offer, someone who feels blindsided, I was willing to trash this initial interview and do a total redo, but John's response was a no. Now, I don't feel a need to do a lot more interviews with these hardcore atheists, or even the atheists who are hardcore but don't appear hardcore, like Gary Marcus and Dr. Stephen Law. But again, as I said in the opening, I think it's crucial that we expose how intellectually feeble these arguments are, and we contrast that with the way that this silliness is propped up in the mainstream science media. Okay, I have one question to tee up from this debate, and it was the one question I was hoping to get to with John, but wasn't able to because, well, you see how the interview went. And that is, to what extent does this stuck-on-stupid debate between Christian apologist and atheist prevent science from making progress on the most fundamental issues of life? Who are we? Where did we come from? Where do we go? Big picture questions. To what extent is the debate holding us back? Of course, the place to respond to that question or formulate a question of your own is through the Skeptico website at skeptiko.com, where you can leave a comment right there in the comment section or click on over to the forum and join the discussion there. We'll have a number of interesting shows coming up, quite a few in the hopper. I don't know which one I'm going to put out next, but you'll just have to wait and see, I guess. Until next time, do take care and bye for now.